Welcome back, everyone. This would be my full Marvel Eternals post credit scene, mid credit scene breakdown. They set up a whole bunch of big things for Marvel Phase 4, so if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. I'll be posting my full breakdown and Easter eggs video for the entire movie next. So careful for spoilers. If you have not seen Eternals yet, we'll be talking about everything, including the blink and you'll miss it first appearance of Marvel's new Blade, Mahershala Ali. That's right, Blade was in the Eternals movie. Some of you may have spotted where he showed up during the post credit scene. But in the first post credit scene, or the mid credit scene, however you want to call it, Makari, Druig, and Thena have taken the Domo, their spaceship, in search of other Eternals on other planets in the universe, with the idea that they're going to try and awaken them Matrix style and help them break away from the Celestial Host and Ershan the Judge, like give them all a bunch of red pills. All with the idea that they're trying to free everyone from this endless cycle of helping birth new Celestials at the cost of planets. It's implied that when the scene picks up, there's been a small time jump and they still haven't found any of the other Eternals yet around the universe. They complain that they also haven't gotten any replies back from the other Eternals who stayed on Earth. That's Cersei, Kingo, Fastos, and Sprite. Now this is coming after the end of the movie. We all saw Ersh and the Judge show up to Earth and then teleport them back to the World Forge, so we know what happened to them, but these characters don't. Then in teleports, Pip the Troll from the comics swilling a giant mug of booze like you see him in the comics, who jokes about not teleporting drunk anymore, and then introduces Star Fox, Eros from the comics, Thanos' younger brother, played by Harry Styles. He introduces himself as another Eternal just like them. His armor is a version of his red and white comic book costume, but the design, the materials are all the same type of armor suits that the other Eternals are wearing. And he reveals that the reason why they haven't heard from Cersei and the others is because Ereshen the Judge has taken them and Eros, he knows how to find them. Revealing that he is another prime Eternal, just like Ajax was, like Cersei became after Ajax passed her special celestial orb to her. He whips his orb out and then they go out on foreigners, feels like the first time. And that's a bit of a clever wink to Star Fox, Eros's powers in the comics, how he basically has the power to make people horny. But it's also meant to be a reference to it feeling like the Eternals' first mission again, because they have this big cycle of reboots where they basically wipe their memories and start over on a new planet. So there's a whole lot going on here in this mid credit scene to process, but the reason why the orb is a big deal is because they explained earlier in the movie, it creates a direct connection between the Prime Eternal who wields it and Ereshim the Judge, so they need one to track Ereshim down. Most of you have probably already guessed where Ereshim took the others, to the Celestials World Forge that we saw earlier in the movie. The World Forge is the place where the Eternals and the Deviants were originally created, where he created thousands upon thousands of Eternals and sent them to all different planets of the universe. This is something that they're going to pay off in Eternals 2, the sequel movie. Some of the Eternals characters will cross over into other people's movies before that because it'll take a couple years to get the sequel out, but a lot of this stuff in the post credit scene and the mid credit scene is stuff that they'll directly address during the next sequel. My early prediction right now is that the World Forge is going to wind up being inside the MCU version of the Black Galaxy, which is like this really dangerous Bermuda Triangle-like galaxy inside the Marvel Universe. It's where Ego the Living Planet came from, it's where Thor fought Silver Surfer for one of the first times. Ereshim had told the others on Earth that he would allow the Earth to continue existing temporarily while he studied their memories, using the Eternals' memories from the past 7,000 years to determine whether or not humans were worthy to continue existing after which he would return to Earth and the Celestial Host would judge the planet, and if they judge them to be not worthy, make all the Thor jokes you want, they would destroy the planet. Even though that sounds like an Avengers 5 kind of story, I feel like they're going to save that for the Eternals sequel movie. Like it'll be Eternals versus the Celestials and they'll be trying to convince them not to destroy the planet, while also trying to get the help of Eternals from other planets. So Star Fox, or Eros, whatever you want to call him, is taking them to the World Forge. He's Thanos' younger brother, and Thanos was about a thousand years old, according to the Russos, during Avengers Infinity War, so Star Fox would just be a few years shy of that, so they're not quite as old as Thor, and not nearly as old as the other Eternal main characters. Most of them are millions of years old. It's a little more complicated when you explain Eros' backstory, because he was born to Eternal's parents, just like Thanos was. Alars was basically like the prime Eternal of Titan like the version of Ajax on Titan, the person who led all their people. That's one of the reasons why Pip the Troll introduces him as the Prince of Titan. Pip the Troll was a really weird side character who was featured heavily during the Thanos Infinity Gauntlet saga in the comics. He was mostly like a court jester kind of character who just got drunk all the time, swilling from that giant tankard. Eventually he did get the Space Stone and teleported all over the universe. One of his other abilities was being able to find anyone anywhere in the universe, kind of the same way that Heimdall can find anyone anywhere. 
So his scene here at the end of the movie just kind of winks at that with the way he teleports in. Also a bit of another Thor Easter egg here too. The way they teleport onto their ship is using Bifrost technology. That's why it looks like the rainbow effect, the same way when they're using the Bifrost in the Thor movies. When Pip says that Eros is from Mystery Planet and he's the defeater of Black Roger, Black Roger was a character that Eros fought on Mystery Planet to try and save this girl during an Avengers Spotlight comic book in a story called The Comedy of Eros. He defeated him using some creative teleporting technology. So the fact that they mention Mystery Planet in Black Roger is just a bit of a wink at what's happening here with him teleporting onto the Domo. I'll do a longer video all about Star Fox's character, his future in the MCU later this weekend after people have a chance to see the movie a little bit more. But in the final post credit scene, Kit Harington's Dane Whitman is at his uncle's castle or manor house in England, very large estate. He opens a case containing the actual ebony blade. And the ebony blade's wrapped in this special shroud that looks kind of like it still has blood on it. There's a carving in Latin inside the case that reads, Death is my reward, mors mihi lucrum. The blade whispers to him with many different voices all on top of each other. It collects souls of the beings that it kills, which is what the voices are, the souls of the people who have been killed by the blade over hundreds and hundreds of years. He starts to psych himself up, saying that he has to try, like he's unsure, and he slowly reaches out to touch the blade. The surface of the blade starts moving around like inky black water, kind of the same way that the Necro sword in the comics has fluidic properties, making it seem like his armor, his Black Knight armor, will form around him, coming out of the blade. Sort of like a magical version of the way that Iron Man's Nanite armor or Black Panther's Vibranium armor forms around them. And just before his fingers touch the blade, off screen, this is our Mahershala Ali Blade cameo scene. First appearance of MCU Blade anywhere canonically inside the MCU. You don't actually see him on screen. Off screen, he says, are you sure you're ready for that, Dane Whitman? And then it just cuts to black to the credits. So why did they have a cameo scene for Mahershala Ali's Blade inside the Eternals post credit scene with the Black Knight? Is he going to be doing something with the Black Knight? Will the Black Knight show up in the new Blade movie? I think that's what they're trying to tell us, is that's the next place we're going to see Kit Harington's Black Knight character. Like he'll be using the Ebony Blade to fight vampires with Blade in Europe somewhere. It's also kind of funny if you think about it because Eternals live forever, essentially, eternally. Who else lives for a long time? Vampires. You could also make a joke about Blade appearing in a scene about a Blade. I'll talk more about Black Knight and Blade crossover when I do that separate Kit Harington Black Knight video later this weekend but it's implied that his uncle is dead when he's opening that case. If you've never read any of the comic book stories with the Black Knight, the whole idea is that his uncle was the previous Black Knight before him to wield the blade, and it was the evil version of the character in the comics. So in the comics, generation to generation, the Black Knight is either a villain or a hero. When Dane Whitman takes up the ebony blade and becomes the Black Knight, he tries to rehabilitate the name of his family so that people don't think of them as villains anymore. That was what he was talking about when he was talking to Cersei about his family history being quote unquote complicated. So it's very clear that Dane Whitman knows all about the Ebony Blade and the curse that it carries and the curse of his family in the history of the Black Knight. Like this isn't the first time that he's seen the blade. The curse that the Ebony Blade carries is that it thirsts for blood. The more blood the blade spills, the more the wielder becomes filled with a bloodlust, berserker rage. The way Kit Harrington described it in interviews recently, he talked about it like an addiction, like you become addicted to the blade. You just want to spill more and more blood. Cersei implied earlier in the movie that he had had some strife with his uncle, like they hadn't been speaking to each other, and that probably had something to do with his uncle succumbing to the curse of the blade and turning into a full-blown villain. If you've read the Berserk manga, it's a lot like the Berserker armor, so it carries a very terrible price, but it makes you incredibly powerful. The Ebony Blade protects him against magical attacks. It can cut pretty much anything, including adamantium. He can summon it to himself the same way that Thor summons Stormbreaker in his hammer. He can also teleport himself to the Blade's location from anywhere. He doesn't need to be touching it in order to do that, so it has a lot of Stormbreaker-like properties. My assumption is, is the way they're setting this up in the MCU, it'll be kind of like a relic level item, the way they talk about it in the Doctor Strange movie. The way Baron Mordo talked about the Staff of the Living Tribunal, magic that was so powerful that in order to contain it, they bound it to an item. There were a couple other big references to the Black Knight throughout the film as well. So at the beginning of the film, Cersei gives him his family's ring that's hundreds of years old, has his family's crest on it, the crest of the Black Knight. As I said, she also is the one that told him, you always meant to make up with your uncle, now is the time to do it. 
Then when the Eternals go back to their ship on the Domo for the first time in present day, Thena picks up a sword and starts swinging it around, and Sprite asks her if it's the Ebony Blade. She says no, it's Excalibur, like the actual Excalibur from the King Arthur Chronicles. And they joke about what King Arthur was like in real life, meaning that Camelot within the MCU was a real place in history, the King Arthur mythology was all real MCU history. So this also gets into the whole origin story behind the Black Knight in the comics and Kit Harington's family line. The original Black Knight was named Sir Percy. He came from Camelot in the time of King Arthur's court. The ebony blade itself was forged by Merlin, meaning that it's possible that Merlin could have been the Sorcerer Supreme during that era, or if the Ancient One was still alive at that point, he studied under the Ancient One. So the whole idea is that if the Eternals were around for the events of Camelot, like they stayed at Camelot and knew King Arthur and his court, all the other people that lived then, that means that Cersei also knew Dane Whitman's ancestor, the Sir Percy Black Knight, and she knows all about who he really is and probably picked up his family's ring back then. Next time I see you, you'll be all in black. So it's implied at the beginning of the film when she gives him the ring, she didn't find it on eBay, she just lied about that. She had it in her possession this whole time for hundreds and hundreds of years. But just like I'm planning on doing another longer Star Fox video, I'll do a longer video for Kit Harington's Black Knight character and what he's going to be doing next and how they're gonna pay that character off. But obviously he will be in the Eternal sequel movies as well. If you have any other questions about what was going on during the mid credit scene or the post credit scene, just write them in the comments below. My full Easter eggs and breakdown video for the entire movie will post tomorrow. Make sure you have alerts enabled for my channel so you don't miss anything. You can click here to watch that full Easter egg video for the entire movie. I'll update the link as soon as I post that tomorrow. And click here for my other Eternals video about how Thanos actually saved the Avengers and the Earth from the Celestials. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.